This videotape shows moving pictures of flying bats and it was made at Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1940. Don Griffin and I, I'm Bob Galambos, were graduate students at the time and we made the movies to summarize the experiments we had been working on for a year or so. We were certain we had discovered how bats avoid obstacles as they fly around in the dark and we want others to see the evidence with their own eyes. We put together two movies, one silent, one with sound, and you will see these unedited here. In the silent one, the bats fly back and forth through wires hanging from the ceiling of a sound-absorbing room in the basement of the Cruft Physics Lab at Harvard. That's Jeanette holding a 12-inch ruler and measuring the distance between the wires. She had married me eight or ten months earlier. I don't remember the small joke that made her smile back there. For many years, Don and I both thought these movies had disappeared forever. But when I visited him a few weeks ago, in early June 1991, he discovered them in a big underground vault where he stores his lifetime collection of this and that. I've not checked these comments with him, by the way, and he may remember some of the happenings differently. The cameraman was an employee of the Harvard Audiovisual Department. I'm sorry I don't remember his name. He was very good, and he went out of his way to give us state-of-the-art quality. Don took the bat to Edgerton's lab at MIT. Many of Professor Edgerton's pictures became famous and won big prizes, but I think this was not one of them. We showed this movie for the first time in Philadelphia in January 1941 at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Don and I also delivered papers from the platform there. His talk covered the sensory deprivation experiments and I talked about their remarkable ears and the cries they make. That shiny stuff you're about to see covering the eyes of a dead animal is mimeograph correction fluid. For those of you who were, are too young to remember, before there were Xerox machines, they used mimeograph machines to duplicate handouts. Whenever you made a typing error on the mimeograph master sheet, you covered it with some quick drying blue goo that you lifted out of a little bottle with a brush. And as soon as this dried, you typed in the correction. The solvent was acetone, or at least that's what we used to remove the stuff from the bats. To deafen our bats, we plugged up little glass tubes that Don inserted into the ear canal and tied in place. I hope you can see the tubes. There's a piece of white paper behind them. In the segment after this one, we plug the tubes up with a piece of string. That's an early version of Donald Redfield Griffin back there. I can tell because I always wore bow ties in those days. Unfortunately, we have no picture of George Washington Pierce. 
emeritus professor of physics at Harvard, who invented the ultrasonic machines we used and arranged for the space we needed, and so on. These movies were only one of many things that cost money, and neither Don nor I supplied it, that's for sure. There were no research grants then either, and so it was Professor Pierce, along with at least one anonymous benefactor, who dipped into their own pockets to supply our needs. Here you see the string in those ear tubes. We did all our sensory impairments this way reversibly with before and after assessments of the performance. And so at the end of the experiment, the bats might be highly indignant, but essentially unharmed. He sure seems to be in trouble. Pow. Whenever one of them hit the wire like that, we called it a crash. To prevent the cries, we tied the mouth shut and sealed the lips with the blue mimeograph goo. The bat spent a lot of time after that scratching away at his mouth, and if he succeeded in opening even a small hole in the gag, his avoidance behavior improved at once. That was another crash. In the movie that's coming up, the bats fly from one room to another through a doorway across which we have stretched black rubber tubing to create the obstacles they must avoid. This is a machine used to study supersonic sound emitted by bats. It extends the range of the human ear by converting supersonic into audible sound, and with it, a permanent record of the sound can be made on paper tape. A crystal microphone receives the supersonics, and a tuning control restricts amplification to a limited band of frequencies. A dial controls the amount of amplification. The recording instrument, not shown here, is equipped with a roll of paper tape on which a marking device writes a permanent record of the supersonic sound. The noises which you will hear when I increase the gain are bat supersonic cries converted by this device into audible sound. We shall now see bats flying and listen to their supersonic cries. We learned later from our library research that Spallanzani, the Italian naturalist, had done most of these experiments before he died, which was 1799. He was sure the bats used their ears, but of course he didn't have any way of knowing that they made sounds we can't hear and that they have ears that can perceive the echoes. That's it. <laughs>